What is the Bible? The Bible is described in many ways. It's described as the Word of God, the Holy Scriptures, the Staff of Life, the Bread of Life, the Sword of the Spirit, all kinds of ways we describe the Bible. But one of the ways we can think about the Bible is that it's an account of a broken relationship. Now, you probably know there's 66 books in the Bible. But do you know how many chapters are in the Bible? Now, every book has a number of chapters, and it's, it's different in every book. Uh, I didn't know until yesterday, but I looked it up. There are 1,189 1, chapters, 1189. The problem of the broken relationship, if you just took the Bible as a series of chapters, the problem begins in chapter 3. That's when the relationship between God and man breaks down. That carries on until chapter 1189, when finally all things are put back together. Now, you could think to yourself, well, this must be a pretty depressing book then. But it isn't a depressing book because God, all the way through it, says, I want to fix this. Okay, If God didn't want to fix the sin problem, the broken relationship, we wouldn't be here. We would have no hope. But it's because we have a God who loves us so much that he wants to put this back together again. Our question this morning is this, does God really care about me? Yes, he does. He cares about me, and I'm so glad about that. He cares about every one of us here, and he cares about everyone in the world. He wants this situation to be resolved. And some people might say to themselves, well, we have a God of love. He's such a good, kind, forgiving God. Surely he's just going to say, I forgive everybody anyway. Others might say, well, no, we have a, this is a tough God. He's a judgmental God. Uh, nobody stands a chance. Well, there's two aspects to God. He is a just God, but he is a gracious God as well. But his forgiveness of us and his restoration of that broken relationship isn't just going to be because he's in a good mood or because he feels a bit sorry for us. There is a process that he will take us through and take all of us through in order for that relationship to be fixed. <clears throat> so think about those two things, the justice of God and the grace of God. He says, no, look, the problem has got to be paid for. There is a consequence to sin. This broken relationship was bad. It's serious. It needs to get fixed. Somebody or something has to sort this out. There is a cost that must be paid. And so he introduces a system where not only is somebody else going to take the punishment, but also he says there is going to be a sacrifice and there is going to be a sense of substitution. Now, bear in mind those two words, sacrifice and substitution. This is how he's going to fix the problem. Now, in the Old Testament, the people of Israel would gather together every year on what was called the Day of Atonement. And this was a special day where God would fix the problem, where he would show the people how he wanted to deal with this sin issue. Now, the people would gather together. Uh, so I've got a picture of them here. Here's the people. Now, obviously, a lot more people than just in our picture here. But all of Israel would gather. Now, Israel was God's chosen people. He gathered them together. He says, you will be my people. I will be your God. And I will show you in a small capacity what I want to do in a larger capacity later on. So he said, let's go through this process. And what's going to happen is as you gather together, we're going to become aware of our sins. Now, the people knew they were sinners. They knew that uh, God uh, is a holy God who can't, who can't cope with sin. He can't deal with it. And so it has to be fixed. And so he says, this is how we're going to do this. The process I'm going to introduce on the Day of Atonement is going to be such that we're going to use something else to put the sin on. And what they used was goats. They used two goats. Now, the first goat was the goat that was to be the Lord's goat. And the Lord's goat was taken and uh, the goat was sacrificed. It was put to death. Uh, and the idea was that the punishment for the sin was placed upon the goat. Now, it sounds a bit grim, doesn't it? But there were other ways God could have done it. He could have said to the people, well, because of what you've done this year, I'm going to wipe all of you out. Well, because he's a gracious God, he didn't do that. He could have said, select one person from among you who will be the sacrifice. Thankfully, he didn't do that. But he said, this is the deal I'll make with you. Let's take a goat, okay? You're more important than a goat. He says, let's take the goat and we'll give the goat the punishment. 
Now, it's say it's tough on the goat, but we're grateful, and the people were grateful that this would happen. The first goat was put to death. The second goat was the goat for the people. And what would happen is the priest would come along and he would pray over the goat and all the sins that they had committed would be prayed over the goat. Should we see the goat here? And what would happen is the priest would do this. In Leviticus chapter 16, we read, He, that's the priest, is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the wilderness in the care of someone appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a remote place, and the man shall release it in the wilderness." So what would happen? The the priest would come along to the goat. He would put his hands on the goat. And what would happen? It was like the sin got transferred from the people over to the goat. And then what would happen is that the goat and the sin together would be led away. We can do this. Far, far away. Great. we thinking, hooray, sin has been dealt with. Wonderful. No. The following year, they had to do it again. Why? Because people sin. It's just part of us. It's part of our nature. We can't help it. And God knows that and he understands it. But he says, let's deal with it again. Let's do it again. Because the following year, we notice that all the sins come back on the people again. Time and time again, they did this. Every year, the process went on. Every year, two new goats were found. And there was the Lord's goat. The Lord's goat would take the punishment. And it became, in a way, the justice goat. The goat that paid the punishment. The goat that met the demands of what God wanted. And then there was the people's goat. The goat of grace. The goat that showed the love of God. And those two things are so important. They balance together perfectly throughout Scripture. Because God is a God of processes. He doesn't just say, look, I'm just going to wash it away. I'm just going to say it doesn't matter. It always matters. And God says, there is a way we deal with this. But he says, I'm doing it in such a way to help you, not to harm you. Let me tell you another story. The other story is not from the Bible, but it's another story by Mark Twain. I say another one because I've used the Mark Twain story before. And uh, the Mark Twain story um, <clears throat> is very helpful. Uh, and it's the story of the prince and the pauper. Now, I don't believe Mark Twain was a Christian, so he's probably turning in his grave the fact that I'm taking his stories and, and finding a gospel message. But there is one there. And the story of the prince and the pauper, it's strange in a way because Mark Twain obviously was American and he's writing a story based in England far before when he was alive. And <clears throat> it's set in the time of London, uh, probably a century or two before Mark Twain lived, and it's set in England. And it's the story of Prince Edward here living uh, at St. James's Palace and a pauper, uh, a boy who's very poor, and his name is Tom Canty. So you can see the palace that the, the prince lives in and you can see this kind of old hovel that, that, that Tom lives in. Now, the boy is a similar age and the prince <clears throat> is pretty fed up of being the prince. He just wants to be a regular kid. He wants to be able to go out. He wants to be able to play. He wants to do the things that regular boys his age do. But instead, because he's going to be the heir to the throne, he spends most of his time training and having to do his studies, learning how to be the king. Tom, on the other hand, wants nothing more than to be the prince. He thinks, wouldn't it be wonderful to be a prince, to, to have nice clothes, to live in a nice palace, to sleep in a nice bed and eat good food? He says that would be wonderful. And so what Tom does is he begs, that's what he does to get money, he begs outside St. James's Palace in the hope that one day he might see the prince. And on this one particular day, he does see the prince. And he's so excited, because that's the person he wants to be, that he kind of starts looking over the fence. Now, one of the soldier guards there, he sees Tom uh, on the fence, and he thinks to himself, this boy's trying to break in. And so he goes up to Tom, he grabs him roughly, and pushes him away. Now, the prince happens to see this. And he's pretty angry with the soldier. He says, this isn't how we're going to be running our country. He says, I don't like to see what you've just done to that boy. And so he invites Tom in to say, come in, come and spend some time and we can play together. 
and for the first time the, the, the prince has a playmate and of course Tom can't believe that he's now in the palace playing with the prince. And they talk about what each of them want to be and that they quickly realise that they'd love to be like in each other's shoes. The prince wants to have friends and Tom wants to be like a prince. And so they suggest to each other, the prince says, hey, do you want to, do you want to feel what it must be to be a prince? He says, put my hat on. And so the hat comes off and Tom starts walking around wearing the prince's hat. And he feels pretty good about that. And then the prince says, well, look, I'll tell you what we can do. Why don't we completely change clothes as well? He says, you can, uh, you can wear my clothes and I'll wear your clothes, even to the point, he says, where you can wear my shoes as well. And as they're getting changed, as Tom starts to put on the prince's clothes, the prince notices that on Tom's arm are big bruises from where the soldier grabbed him roughly. And the prince is so angry at the bruises that the soldier has put upon Tom that he marches down to, uh, to where the soldier is to say to him, this was, this was out of order, you shouldn't have done this. Now, the soldier sees a boy dressed like this coming towards him. He immediately assumes it's Tom. Now, have you noticed, and perhaps I should have mentioned this earlier, the two boys look very, very similar. That's the whole essence of the story, is they look like they could be twins. And so, of course, the prince, now dressed as Tom, comes up to the soldier, starts rebuking him. What does the soldier do? He thinks, what's this ragamuffin doing, having, rebuking me? I'm going to throw him out. <laughs> So the, the prince, dressed as Tom, is now thrown out, and he's saying, but you've got to let me back in. I'm the prince. I'm the prince. And the soldier thinks, well, you don't look like the prince, so I'm pretty sure you're not the prince. You can see what happens. There has been a swap of places. Tom, now dressed as the prince, can't get out of the palace. He keeps protesting that he's not the prince, but nobody believes him. Meanwhile, the prince, dressed as Tom, he can't get back into the palace, and so there has been this complete role reversal. Now, the reason I'm telling you this, and by the way, it does get, without giving too many spoilers, it does get resolved in the end, but it helps me to understand how God fixes my problem. Because we spoke about the Old Testament, and the Old Testament kept looking towards the day when God would fix this problem forever. Here we have a picture of a human, and we have a picture of Jesus. Now you notice the human, two things you notice about him. One is he is covered in sin. Again, I've said this before, it's very hard to draw sin, but just this kind of blotches all over him, okay? Dirty, just messy, his life's messed up. And he's standing on the earth. And there's Jesus floating above the earth, just indicating that he comes from heaven. And God says, I want to fix this problem. I've got to solve this sin problem because humans can't fix it themselves. And what he does, God sends Jesus to this earth to come alongside. He comes as a human. And there he is. He comes to live among us, to help us, to explain the way of God, to preach the word, but to come alongside and to deal with the sin problem. And Jesus says this. He says, I'm going to make a deal with you. As you confess your sins to this human who's representative of all of us who want to find God, he says, as you confess your sins, it will be like your sins are removed from you. Where do the sins get put? Just as the priest prayed over the goat, so the sins go upon Jesus. What does Jesus do with the sins? He takes the punishment for them, and the Bible says he is put to death on the cross. Meanwhile, we have this robe of righteousness floating about. What do we do with that? Well, the Bible says it comes to the human. And what the human is able to do now, because he's covered with the righteousness of Jesus, he is now able to go to be with God because his sins have been dealt with. Do you see how Jesus is the fulfillment one time of that process that could never be fulfilled year after year after the year. It's like Jesus is both of the goats. Firstly, he is the Lord's goat, if I can put it like that. He's the one who bears the punishment for the sin. And secondly, he's the people's goat. He's the goat of grace as well as the goat of justice. He bears the sins of the people and the sins are removed. Listen to what Isaiah says. He says in Isaiah 61, 
For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. We don't immediately become righteous. We don't suddenly, it's not as if we've never done anything wrong, but we're covered with the righteousness of Jesus. As he takes our sin, he clothes us in his righteousness, that righteousness that equips us to stand before God and God to accept us. What does God say? In Psalm 103, he says this, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us when we trust in Jesus. Jesus fulfills the processes that needed to be fulfilled, and because of that, God receives us. When I look at the cross, I think of two things. The cross reminds me of how seriously God takes sin, but the cross also reminds me of how much God loved me for him to send Jesus to die in my place. So as we consider this, um, I want to talk a little bit about a, a portrait of love. How do we know that this adds up to love? And I would just say that today, among days, is a great example of how this adds up to, to love. If you take a portrait of mom, and it, it is too long to really go through, but this, this day is a big deal where we celebrate moms. It's, it's huge. And uh, uh, this day actually was, was, uh, became a national holiday. Mother's Day became a national holiday in 1914. Woodrow Wilson declared it uh, a national holiday. And just so you have perspective, it was President Richard Nixon in 72 that gave us Father's Day. So for decades, we acknowledged there's, there's something in this, in the, in the family unit, there is something potentially special about moms. Now, let me just say kind of uh, right up front, and Malcolm kind of mentioned this too, uh, we're human beings and not all of us had great moms. And none of us had a perfect mom. Um, but generally speaking, there are some characteristics about mom and her love that are pretty universal across cultural, across time for the most part. And, and the first is this idea of sacrifice. We understand that moms sacrifice. They are the ones, um, we don't have any memory of this. Uh, we don't really get this until we have our own crying child. But they are the ones that when uh, we were young for months, whenever we needed something, it was generally mom who got up and took care of us. When we were sick in the middle of the night, when we had to stay home, it was mom who took care of us. It was, it was mom who generally was there to kind of drive us around. I, I didn't even think about this growing up, but I was highly, highly active in sports and extracurricular activities. I was everywhere all the time, and I got there, and I got home because of my mom. Because she sacrificed her time. She sacrificed from her day. Most of us don't understand again until we're later how much our mom sacrificed maybe their career. Maybe they sacrificed their body. They sacrificed their dreams. They sacrificed their self-esteem at times in order to raise us. And, and on this day, it's kind of like we just kind of pause. I don't know about you. Let me, put it, let me put it this way. This is what I do. I kind of pause and I think about my mom and for a second, I strip myself of me and I think of all that my mom poured in my life. And I, the sacrifice is just overwhelming. And kind of on the same, same note is this idea of selflessness. And it goes hand in hand with sacrifice. But uh, often if we need something, it's mom who goes without. It's not always mom. It can be dad too. But, but it's, it, we acknowledge that mom goes without so that we can have something. We acknowledge that, that mom is the one who, uh, again, this comes years later, but she was the one who cleaned up after us. She worked hard, long, and tirelessly and faithfully only for us to leave whatever it is that we left again. And then when she asked us, act, roll our eyes and act like it was the end of the world because she was asking us to do something for ourselves. Because, you know, 
Like my kids uh, said, uh, when they were in preschool, they asked, you know, what is it your mom loves to do? And they're like, she loves to vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> they're selfless. And it's moms who takes the brunt. You get, remember, I want you guys to key, remember this. Remember those teenage years when all of a sudden you began to wake up to the cruelty of this world? Remember those teenage years when folks were picking on you and you felt really insecure? Who took the brunt of our anger? Mom. Mom. We couldn't, we couldn't rail at the world. We couldn't rail it. So we went home and we got angry at mom. And mom, a good mom, generally, just kind of took that in. She didn't take it personal. A good mom is sympathetic, compassionate. She knows you the best, and yet she is still your fan. Your, your, mom, your mom knows the real you, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And yet she's still fans, so much so that when your mom says something positive, you go, oh, you have to say that, your mom. Your mom will hold you any time of day or night when you needed her, right? Gen generally speaking, again, this isn't always true, but generally speaking, a good mom is, is the one you go to when you're in pain. She's the one that gives you uh, grace and sympathy and tells you it will get better. Moms love you even when you don't love yourself. Again, think about those adolescent years where mom was so faithfully there encouraging you, telling you what all those tapes in your head were telling you. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not successful enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. And mom's there going, yes, you are, honey. Yes, you are. Work a little harder. Keep at it. Moms are also good. A good mom is also straightforward. In other words, it's not just grace. A good mom tells the truth. Moms nag you for all the right reasons. It's raining. Take an umbrella. Wear a warm jacket. Make sure you have clean underwear because you never know when you might get in an accident. <laughs> And, and again, to us, it, it, it's nagging. It's like, oh, mom. But, but the motivation behind it is mom wants the best for us. Mom doesn't want us to get sick. Mom wants us to be successful. Mom wants us to stay out of trouble for us. And, of course, we fight her tooth and nail. At least I did. Anytime you felt like your mom was hard on you, when you look back, you begin to see it was for your benefit. For the most part, you begin to see it was your benefit. And remember, we're, I mean, we're convinced at the moment, right? Our, our parents, our moms are out to get us. They don't understand. It's amazing how much more understanding they get when we get out into the world that they're trying to protect us from. A good mom has an eye towards the future. They understand the world. And a good mom gives just feedback, honest, straightforward feedback. Why? So we can become who we really want to become. Achieve what we really want to achieve. A good mom. Sacrificial, selfless, sympathetic, and straightforward. That's what makes a good God. Hmm. When we're answering answer question, does God care about me? We look at the resurrection and the love of God shines. Because the resurrection is the culmination of this process. You see, in the, in the uh, Hebrew scriptures, this goat takes the sin. It's still wandering out there. The Bible describes sin like this in the Hebrew scriptures. Sin is covered over. In other words, I don't know if you've, if you've ever... Um, had put something really smelly in the trash, but you didn't want to take it out, so what do you do? You just throw something on top. That's the Hebrew scriptures in sin. It's not taken care of. It's still there. It's just kind of hidden away. But God is just. He's a truth teller. The truth is that sin destroys us, destroys relationship with each other, destroys relationship with God. 
And the grace part of God, the sympathetic part of God, from day one was says, I got a plan. The great exchange. God loves you and I. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 and 21, it says this, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. He is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, of those who have died. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man, being Jesus. In other words, because Christ was raised from the dead, he became the first of a, of a great harvest of those who would be raised life again. There, when your crops begin to... Um, when your crops begin to, to yield their fruit, right? There's a, a, a early kind of, you get early fruit. And you go out and you pick the early fruit. And it's an indication of how good that year is going to be. And what he's saying, when Christ raised the dead, it was a great indication that there will be others like him where this problem of sin will be taken care of through Christ, that we too may be risen from the dead. That is good news. That is the love of God. That he paid that penalty for us. And it was a once and for all. Because he was God in flesh, it wasn't just covered over. It wasn't just covered over. Now it's as far as the east is from the west. And if you know, that never ends. It just keeps on going. Unlike north and south, right? You go north long enough, you start going south again. But east and west don't work that way. It is gone. It was a one-time sacrifice, and it was a sacrifice. It was a life of selflessness. So God could both show that he is just, that's truth, and he was the one who gave, that took on the penalty himself. He justified us. That is grace. That is God's love. So here is what I think the key question is when we ask this question. When we ask the question, does God really love me? What we're really saying is, if God cares about me, then how come my life is so hard and unfair? I, th I, th I think we understand I mean, this idea that God demonstrated his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But there's something in our head going, okay, that's fine and dandy. But, and there's always a but, if God really loved me, then then how come there's cancer? If God really loved me, how come my kids are going crazy? If God really loved me, how come this friend abandoned me? If God really loves me, how, can I lost, how come I lost this job? If God really loved me, yada, 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 yada. The uh, scripture says this, John 16, verse 33. I think it's wrong in your notes. It's verse 33. It says, Jesus is telling them that he, that he must leave and he's kind of explaining a little bit of this process. He says this, he says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have, what, peace. Now notice this next line. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. What, what, what Jesus is saying, listen, um, I am for you. He's telling his disciples this who are about to go through a really, really hard time. He says, I am for you. But here's the deal. The world is not. It is a broken world. Listen, mommy cannot go with you throughout your entire life and protect you from life. She can't. And, and parents, if, especially if you have young ones, let, let me just tell you, no matter what decision you make, you will lose. If you get them in a sport, they will grow up and say, I can't believe you forced me to play sports. If you don't get them in a sport, they'll say, I don't believe that you didn't make me do something active. And why? Because it's human, it's human nature to say, if you love me, then somehow you would have made perfect decisions for me, and I, wouldn't have had, I don't have to take responsibility. It's your fault. It's your fault. Even though, they, even though, and this is, goes for all of us, right? Because we, we all went through this stage. We can't point any fingers because all the fingers are pointing back at us. And, and, there's, and there's, God's telling us, this is a hard, tough, sinful world. People are self-centered. There is sin in the world. We miss the mark. We talked about that last week, right? We miss the mark because we are selfish human beings. And as, and as long as the world is like that, 
then it's going to be like that. Does mom not love you because she doesn't say, you know what, honey, you just stay in your room for the rest of your life. And dad and I will work and we'll provide food for you. We'll make sure that you have the right kind of, you know, media. Anything you want, we'll take care of. But you cannot leave your room because the world out there is bad. Would that be love? No. What's the best a good mom can do, a good parent can do? Prepare your child for the trouble. In this world, you're going to have trouble. But then he says, but take heart, have courage. Why? Because I've overcome the world. In other words, I will help you get through. I will give you my peace. Let me explain it this way. I, I, I had the advantage growing up. Um, I had older brothers and sisters, not just like one or two years older than me. I'm talking about the next oldest after me is nine years older. And my oldest brother is 25 years older than me. And so they had lived a lot of life when I was really, really young. And here's one of the things that I saw. My brothers and sisters, some made good decisions, some made not so good decisions. But almost every single one of them hit a hard patch in their life. And they would come back for a month to a year and live with us. And mom and dad would put them on their feet, would love them, give them time to get through school or get a job or just get their confidence back, and then they'd go back out again. So when I went back out, in the, in, in, or not back out, when I went into the world, when I left, now I was scared like everybody else. I didn't know what I was doing like everybody else. I was a little bit unsure of myself like everybody else, but I also had an unusual confidence. And the reason I was confident is because I felt free that I could go in the world and fail because I knew if it really ever got bad, mommy and daddy would help me. Now, they weren't going to let me go and be a 30-year-old and live in their house and I'm done. I, 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 can, I can be a kid. They wanted me to grow up. But I knew that they, were, that they were there. And God is very much loving in this way. This is where his peace comes in. He says, listen, you're going to have trouble. You're going to get sick, but I'll be there. You're going to lose your job, but I'll be there. The relationships are going to let you down, but I'll be there. You live in this world. And as long as your feet are, this, are on this earth, you will deal with this. But here's the good news. Slowly but surely... I can help you manage these consequences and you can live in my blessing. But here's my promise to you. In the end, I will bring you into myself. I will glorify you and you will have peace. That is what I'm preparing you for. Yes, you got to go through this weird time, teenage, young adulthood, but that's not, what I'm, that's not ultimately what I'm preparing you for. I'm not trying to protect you from that. Why? Because I'm trying to get you through that to the real deal. God loves you. God loves you. And when we see the power of the resurrection, not only do we glorify in the fact that he took care of this issue once and for all, but we take comfort in the fact that he is committed now and he has the power to raise us too. Amen? Amen. I want you to read it for yourself. We're going through the book of John, and, and you'll notice in your handout here the words of life, the podcast, the readings for this week, that there's actually six days because we're going to finish up the book uh, this week and take a break. So it's Monday through Saturday this week. The readings are there, and you can go online for the podcast. So the worship team comes up. Let me just pray for us. God, I thank you for this radical, radical love. That, Lord, you, you knew ahead of time, kind of like our moms do. Our moms know that we're going to struggle with self-esteem. Our moms know that we're going to struggle with the words of this world. Our moms know that um, life can be hard, and they strive to protect us. But the difference is, dear God, you already see the future. And then when you look down through the annals of time, you saw that our incapability to, to handle it ourselves, and so... You gave us an object lesson very early on that when we miss the mark, the result of that is death. Something must die. And even that death 
just covers it over. And then you gave us, dear Father, the ultimate. We were saying all along of how you're going to take care of sin, of how you're going to love us. You demonstrated your love that you gave your son who lived a selfless life in both grace and truth and sacrificed himself in love. Thank you for that. Thank you that you showed the power to help us in the now and into glory through the resurrection. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.